I earned uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in music theory composition in the mid-1970s at U Minnesota and U California San Diego, uh, respectively. At that time, way back in ancient history, I self-identified as an avant-garde composer with special interests in improvisational multimedia performance and in the then brand new field of electronic music synthesizers. This is pre-digital, I mean, a whole different world from today. However, the first real world job that presented itself was in arts administration and museum management on the ground floor of a consortium of nonprofit cultural organizations in northeastern Minnesota. And I ended up staying in that field for over 20 years, most recently with a regional history museum, and all the while maintaining strictly amateur status as a musician. Then when I allowed myself to have the proverbial midlife crisis of identity and purpose, uh, some of you haven't been here yet, um, I resolved to get back to what truly interested me most, which was music. But I realized that along the way, perhaps as a result of working in history museums, I had become less interested in injecting myself into the future as a postmodernist composer, and had rather become more interested in uh, preservation and dissemination of cultural heritage as a historian and bibliographer. So thus, I decided to reinvent myself as a musicologist and music librarian. And I enrolled at the State University of New York Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo, uh, back in 2000. I earned my MLS uh, in music librarianship at the School of Informatics there. And after completing 70 credits of historical musicology seminars and all doctoral comprehensive exams, I'm still plugging away at a PhD dissertation on the symphonic works of a little known mid 19th century American composer. You can ask me after. <laughs> uh, music librarianship is um, musically literate, reading music historically informed, performance and listening oriented expertise in the management of the musical resources, the books, the periodicals, the scores and the recordings, uh, both physical and virtual, in any of a number of types of music libraries or library divisions, academic, public, conservatory or music school, uh, performance libraries of philharmonic orchestras and opera companies, uh, museums, archival institutions. Along with the expertise must be a love for music and a strong desire to promote the use of these resources to musicians, to music lovers, and to music scholars at all different levels. Some read music, some don't. Now all music librarians have at least an undergraduate degree in music, and most have master's degrees and often additional postgraduate study in a specialized area. A music librarian can read music, this is a basic, has extensive knowledge of classical music theory, history, and repertoire, and is familiar with basic musical terminology in all the principal European languages. Scores can be published anywhere, and you have to be able to read at least the title page, even if it's in Polish. I'm not an expert on Polish, but I can probably puzzle it out. In the US, the discipline of musicology and the specialty of music librarianship grew up together, so to speak, with some of the very same seminal figures pioneering in both air areas in the early 20th century. So thus, music scholars, music performers, and music librarians have enjoyed a particularly close relationship historically, at least in the United States. This is not necessarily true in Europe, where like, archivists like to hold their holdings close to the vest. And after you have visited their archive for five years, they might tell you about something special they have. You know, totally different in the United States, much more open and collaborative. Now since the summer of 2005, I have been a reference and instruction librarian here in Johnson Center Library, which is one of five libraries on the three campuses of George Mason University. And I serve as the GMU Library's liaison to the departments of music, dance, and theater. Can't dance? Don't ask me. <laughs> GMU is less than 40 years old as an independent institution, uh, it, but it now has over 30,000 students. Uh, the institution has definitely been in rapid expansion mode for the last several years. 
uh, the music department, for example, has about 350 undergraduate music majors in a building originally designed to support 100, as well as 75 students in master's programs uh, with a doctoral program beginning next fall. There are a dozen full-time music faculty and about 60 private music instructors and adjunct professors, including myself. Uh, a new building is planned. By virtue of being an adjunct music instructor, I rationalize appropriating for my personal use a music stand because a music professor can't teach without a music stand. After my first month or so on the job, it became clear from gaps in the collections, inconsistencies in the cataloging and physical processing, and the relatively simple nature of many reference questions from music students Dare I say it from some faculty, GMU seems not to have had a librarian with a music specialty for a long time, if ever. That might explain why a music professor was actually included on the search committee for a performing arts librarian. They really needed a music person. Now, the term liaison librarian is loosely speaking merely updated jargon uh, for the older term subject specialist. And it seems to have first surfaced in the literature of librarianship in the late 1980s and become <coughs> more widespread by the late 1990s. Although institutions with formal liaison programs may offer slightly differing job descriptions, many incorporate therein not only the traditional activities of subject-specific collection development, classroom bibliographic instruction, and research assistance, but also require, or at least encourage, more interaction and collaboration than before with the assigned department, innovation in the delivery of services, and a frankly market-oriented or entrepreneurial approach to identifying and meeting information needs. In other words, try new things, advertise yourself, and seek face time. But it became clear to me that a significant number of undergrads and incoming graduate students, as well as a handful of faculty, we're not up to full speed or even half speed on the library's burgeoning print and electronic resources, and also we're not as internet savvy as we like to think they are. I decided that a series of brief, non-intimidating demonstration programs was in order. I would address topics for which I suspected there was a need to know, and in which I hoped there would be interest within the confines of an informal, come as you are, like today, 55 minute early afternoon talk right here in the Johnson Center Library's instruction room. Once a month, open to anybody, no sign up needed. Now, GMU Libraries had already had a drop-in instructional model in place for several years, featuring frequent, regularly scheduled one-shot workshops, such as Introduction to Library Research Basics, scholarly sources for English 302, ancillary to our Gen Ed Advanced Writing course, Beyond Google, EndNote Basics in Advanced, Hands-on GIS. After my amused library director advised against my original series title, Drive-By Musicology, <laughs> I settled on the safer and more predictable drop-in musicology and began implementing this series in the spring of 2007, a little more than a year ago. This continued through the doldrums of summer, more for consistency's sake than for momentum, and on through this current semester. I've thus allowed over a year to see if this format is effective and worth continuing. 